Welcome everyone. Welcome to the 166th session of the online Optum Learning Series, OLS. And for today's session, we have with us a very special guest. Uh, we have Mr. Anna Safaris. Uh, he is an entrepreneur in eye medical devices with extensive experience in management roles for devices that has had huge, huge impact around the world. He is a co-founder of Eaglet Eye and the Eye Surface Profiler, which has transformed the way people practice specialty contact lenses in more than over 20 countries. And uh, today he is going to share with us about how do we go about transforming the practice using profilometry. And before we begin this session, uh, just wanted to mention that this is just about learning. There is no vested interest from Eaglet Eye, from the speaker or from OLS. So I hope you enjoy, learn from this session. And with that, let me welcome, sir, uh, all the way from the Netherlands and talking to us uh, about the expertise, what he has been creating. So welcome, sir. And let me just, uh, you know, leave the screen time to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fakrudin. Um, it's such a... Um... Such an honor to be here, uh, honor to be a part of the online Optom uh, learning series. And uh, it's absolutely my pleasure to, uh, to spend a bit of time with you to explain more about profilometry and, uh, and the role it can have for, um, uh, for um, uh, specialty contact lens fitting. Um, so uh, we, have a, we have a quick moment for um, uh, the first online poll, or actually it's the second. Yes. Um, so let's um, allow everyone a, a, a quick moment to fill that in. Um, please share with the rest of the, the group uh, what, uh, where you stand on squirrel lens fitting. Uh, we do have people who are fitting less than five fits a month. A couple of them a bit experienced, about six to ten uh, fits. A large number, uh, I would say, who are currently not fitting because it's a student population. But I hope this will, uh, you know, encourage them in the future to start fitting scleral lenses. Exactly. Very good. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We'll go to the second one and see what. So majority of them think about two to three uh, lens refits would be required to achieve the best fitting. So that's the yep. Uh, one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let's get this started. Um, so a quick uh, look at the at the agenda. First, we'll uh, we'll have a look at the at the sclera. Uh, what 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 is uh, what do we know about the the scleral shape? And um, and then next we go into uh, uh, best practice ways of measuring the sclera. Uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll dig into uh, fitting scleral lenses and uh, and then a very brief kind of sidestep into ortho K lenses. And, uh, and then we'll switch to uh, four case examples uh, by um, users that we're in close contact with, uh, Dr. Barnett, Dr. Vidauri, uh, Dr. Morrison, and uh, Dr. Wolf. And, uh, and they, will, uh, they will be with us via a video uh, recording. And, uh, and after that, we, uh, we close off with, uh, with a question and answer session. And um, so let's go. So the sclera, um, I mean, up until quite recently, there was not a lot we knew about the scleral shape, uh, the, the uh, anterior shape of the sclera. Uh, what we did know was that the extraocular muscles influence the shape of the sclera. Uh, that, that is, that's, of course, been, been known for, uh, for, for quite some time. But um, what then happens in between those extra extraocular muscles and, and say the limbus, um, not a lot was known. And, and, and early in this century, there was some work being done with um, anterior segment OCT. But of course, that only allows a, surf, surf, uh, a single cross section to be viewed. And it was really when profilometry um, became available that um, the full uh, sclera could be mapped and therefore analysis could be done. And this has led to a 
a whole list, a whole uh, flurry of, of publications. And, um, and I'm only going to be able to, to highlight a few, but uh, hopefully all of these will, uh, will elucidate the, the subject. So this is a, a research done by Dr. Jetlika at the Indiana University in the US, um, where they, they try to determine whether you can predict the scleral shape from the corneal shape. And, um, and, and they only found uh, a weak correlation. So, um, and, and basically they, they had to say uh, no to that. But one other surprising thing that came out of the study is that for corneas against the rule, toricity is, is fairly rare, um, but it's much more common for uh, scleros. And uh, so that was one thing that, that came out of the study. And some other uh, publications say that closer to the limbus, the asymmetry is, is relatively small. But the further out you go, the more asymmetric the sclera shape becomes. And there's also something that the more irregular the, the corneal surface is, the more irregular the scleral surface will be. So there's definitely, so pathologic eyes, they tend to have very uh, irregular um, uh, sclera as well. And... Um, So if we move on, there was a large study done um, in the US and uh, also looking at, so can we extrapolate from the, from the cornea into, into the sclera? And their conclusion is that you cannot do that. Uh, you cannot predict precisely the, the shape of the, of the sclera on the basis of the shape of the cornea. So here are a set of uh, ocular surface uh, maps, and uh, these are elevation maps, and I will, I will explain in more detail later on what that, what that implies and what, the, what is behind that. But suffice to say that right here we have the, this inner circle uh, is, is the cornea, and of course around that, surrounding that in this annulus is, is, um, is the sclera. And if we go from, from, from left to right, uh, on the very left, we see uh, a cornea that appears to be quite uh, spheric. And, um, and the same can be said for, uh, for the sclera. Uh, you see a fairly regular pattern um, indicating that it is about the same height everywhere and indicating a, a, a spheric shape. If you move one to the right, we see that the cornea has uh, these, these, these blue colors indicate that it's, it's lying lower compared to the horizontal meridian. And uh, so there is tericity there visible. And a same, similar pattern of tericity is also visible for the sclera. So here the two follow each other. Um, if we go to the central map, we see, uh, well, one thing that stands out is this, this red angry dot in the center of the cornea uh, indicating a keratoconus, a cone for, from a keratoconus. And, and what we see as well on the, on the, on the scleral shape is that actually it's, it's become quite irregular. Um, there is no symmetrical pattern um, uh, visible and it, it's, it's quite varied. If we then go to one more to the right, here we have a pellucid marginal generation eye. So this is highly irregular. And as you, as was, was indicated by the publication, you see um, a, a matching kind of highly irregular uh, scleral shape uh, uh, with that. And the last one is, is also interesting because this is a post-LASIK eye. So uh, a part of the, uh, of the cornea has been ablated and therefore it's become uh, an oblate shape, a flattened shape. And, um, and here you see uh, it appears that it doesn't have had, it doesn't had uh, much influence on, uh, on the scleral shape. 
Um, so that, uh, that still looks quite regular. So if we dig a bit deeper into um, the symmetry or asymmetry of, of the sclera, um, there's been a, an extensive study done, um, 152 eyes, uh, by this, this group led by Greg Denayer and, uh, and Jason Jetlika. And it found that a very small minority, just, uh, just under uh, 6% of eyes of, of scleras, I should say, is spheric. And, um, and a much larger group, uh, just under 30% is, is regular toric. And the largest group of this is quad specific. And with quad specific, we mean that they have elevations and depressions that are roughly at, uh, at 180 degrees um, apart from each other. Um, and irregular is, is, is patterns of elevation and depression where there's no such um, linear uh, symmetry as you have with quad specific. And even that is still 26%. So it's almost the same as regular torque. So you can see that um, the, the shape of the sclera is, is irregular. And I can tell you, it's much more irregular than we ever thought it was. And, uh, and thanks to profilometry, we're capable of capturing um, the full 3D profile of the eye, hence profilometry. And, uh, and are able to, to make, make these kinds of, uh, of assessments. But toricity, um, and also as mentioned before, um, it can have multiple orientations and more so than, than the cornea, cornea typically does. And, uh, and you might recognize this image here where the toricity of the, of the cornea is, is with the rule. And so it is for the sclera. And, uh, and here, actually, you see that the sclera has a toricity that is against the rule. You could argue oblique. Uh, is there some di diagonali diagonality in it? Um, and, and, the, and the cornea seems to be uh, fairly spheric. Um, and here is a, is a more clear example of oblique toricity. And, and, and so... In, out of the, the research that's been done with, uh, with the help of profilometry, um, um, researchers have noticed that the orientation of, uh, of the toricity is more variable than it, uh, it, norm it usually is with uh, corneas. And on the very right, you have an example of uh, irregular um, uh, elevation distribution across the sclera. And, and so we cannot determine this in any way as, as a form of, of touristy. Another feature which, um, well, sometimes is, 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 is fairly prevalent and, and others can be, can be quite rare, but all of these, um, these ocular surface uh, features or these scleral surface features um, they can have severe impact on, on specialty contact lens fitting, particularly on scleral lens fitting. Uh, uh, Pringuicula, particularly in, in sunny countries, can be uh, fairly common. And uh, we see uh, an example here in the middle of a map, and we see this, this, this white uh, dot there um, protruding from the rest of the scleral surface. And it will, when, when, when that, when a, a scleral lens lands there, it will create significant amount of friction and irritation of the eye, therefore leading to discomfort, which can potentially uh, negatively influence the, the actual, the, the wear time and, um, and the overall patient, uh, patient satisfaction. So all of these things uh, can have a huge impact. Uh, think about scars after retinal surgery and when the incision is made uh, close to the limbus, um, all of that can, can have a significant impact. And if you then have with, with profilometry, you have a means of actually measuring that and not just the, the location, but also the actual height of it, it could make a significant difference for your ability to, to fit 
um, uh, a squirrel lens uh, with, uh, with confidence. So just in, um, in conclusion, um, so does the, the cornea give us enough information for a scleral lens fit? Um, well, it certainly helps compared to knowing nothing at all, eh? because it can help with the central clearance of the, of, the, of the scleral lens, but it does not give enough information about the edge, the haptic of the, of the scleral lens, because you cannot predict the shape of the uh, sclera. Uh, based on corneal information. And, uh, and that, that is and then directly also the, the answer to the second question, uh, you know you cannot uh, predict the spheral shape uh, on the basis of the cornea. And, and so having um, a profilometry uh, at your disposal can really help in uh, reducing the number of refits and uh, improving the, the patient outcome. So next chapter is, is measuring um, the sclera with, uh, with profilometry. So what, what does that, uh, what is required and, and how does that work? So um, uh, one of the uh, devices available is the ice surface profiler, which um, uh, generates about a half a million data points. Um, so um, it basically measures the, the, the front surface of the eye as far as the eye is exposed. And um, so technology of profilometry, um, it starts with fluorescein that needs to be instilled onto the tear film. Fluorescein is, let's call it the magic sauce that, uh, that makes profilometry work. And, um, and it's then hit with, uh, by the instrument by uh, a line pattern uh, of cobalt blue light. And of course, when blue light hits a fluorescein molecule, it is scattered in, in all directions. Uh, we've all seen that with uh, slit lamp use and, 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 and sometimes with other instruments as well. And, um, and that therefore allows, as you can see on the photos here, allows for complete coverage of, of the front surface of the eye, uh, the full cornea, and then everything that is exposed from, uh, from this clear up. So this is uh, what happens from the patient's perspective. Um, so basically you hold open the eyelids, you center on the two Purkinje dots, and with those two snowballs, you center the image. You, you click and there's a very fast millisecond process that will then take the, the two photos. And, uh, and that is enough. Just to, to show that to you again, you hold open the eyelids, you center on the two Purkinje dots and you focus on the two snowballs there and, uh, and you hit fire and you're done. Um, this is the, the, the profilometry measurement process. And, oh, let's not do it a third time. So single shot, uh, there's no extrapolation needed because you have all the data already. And, um, and you basically have all the, yeah, you have a complete height information of the ocular surface. And with that, you can uh, create any, any kind of map uh, or, or parameter that you would require to assess the, the, the surface of the, of the eye. Um, the raw data that comes out is, is height, is height data. So what you see on the right here are the 500,000 data points and uh, from, the, from the apex to the, to the very, very uh, periphery of, of the map. And what's probably going to be a little bit hard for you to see, but the, the scale here is actually six millimeters. So from top to right to the bottom, it's six millimeters. And at a scale of six millimeters, we hardly see any kind of shape patterns on the eye. And, and so whilst this is very good for one-on-one -on -one assessment or difference maps um, of, of the actual surface, because this is the, the, the real raw data, uh, if you want to visually analyze this, there's not much we can, we can, uh, we can see. And this is why um, uh, people have come up with the elevation map, which basically takes that absolute height and then subtracts a best fitted sphere and those two best fitted spheres are, can be seen here in this, this yellow dotted 
uh, line and the green dotted line. So what happens here with profilometry is that there is an elevation map specifically for the cornea and uh, an elevation map specifically for the sclera um, with, a, with each their own uh, best fitted uh, sphere subtracted from the absolute height data. And, uh, and that's the essence of, uh, of profilometry. And, and this is the same eye as we saw before with the absolute value. And, and you see what a world of difference this makes, because suddenly we see this, this pinguicula here. Let me just go back. The pinguicula is here, and it's kind of visible, but there is, there's very little we can, we can actually see. Whereas here, it's, uh, well, it really stands out. And uh, also from the cornea, we see it's a, it's a regular cornea, uh, spheric. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of toricity here, which is influenced as well, of course, by the, uh, by the pinguicula. And um, so with an elevation map, you suddenly have uh, much more power over assessing the, the, the shape of the, of the cornea and the sclera. So again, uh, so we, we've, we've gone over this, but now we, we know that these are elevation maps. So the, 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 the red colors are where the, the eye is, is relatively higher and, and the blue and green colors is where the eye is relatively deeper and therefore steeper. And, and, and so you, you, once you know that, it's fairly easy to, uh, in, your, in, your, in your mind to, to imagine what that exact shape of the, um, of the eye is. And uh, yeah, you see the double pinguicula case here. And, and, and so very quickly, you can assess those, um, those ocular shapes. Uh, another map that um, can be really useful is the um, tangent angles map. And, and, and that sounds a bit like uh, tangential curvature, but it's, it's not the same. So what it is, it, it takes for every point in the map, it takes the local slope, and um, so the tangent angle, um, and, um, and basically puts that into, in, into a map. So what we typically can see is that, and this is, this is uh, very typical for most uh, eyes, is that on the nasal side, um, the eye is slightly flatter, whereas on the temporal side, um, it actually uh, it goes quite steep. Uh, the, the angle is high. Um, and uh, this is very typical for, for most, uh, most eyes. Tangent angles can also be used for, uh, well, here again, uh, we see a, a nice example of, of nasal flattening. So um, the, uh, the angles here are relatively low, whereas on the temporal side, the, uh, the angles are, are very steep or high. And, uh, but some eyes actually don't have such a pronounced nasal flattening. And of course, this will have influence on, on um, your fitting strategy for uh, specialty contact lenses. And what sometimes shows up is um, if a patient has been wearing scleral lenses and they come to the practice and, 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 and too short before the actual measurement, they took off their lenses, then that scleral lens will have, will have pushed in on the, on the, on the sclera and, uh, and, and, and will have uh, created a, a, a ring of depression which we, can, uh, which we can actually see here. Um, yeah, this is, is relatively flat. And, um, and so that is also useful of the, of the tangent angles map. There's another map in the system that um, assesses the, the symmetry or the asymmetry of the sclera. And it basically does so in four categories, uh, spherical, uh, if you have two colors, it's, it indicates it's more toric. Uh, when you see four colors appear, it, 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 it pushes it as um, at quad specific, or it could be uh, more irregular than that. And then it's indicated as well, just to help practitioners to, um, uh, to, to assess the, the surface. 
And before we, um, we switch to uh, fitting scleral lenses, um, I believe it's time for our next poll. Your views on, do you think that there are opportunities to grow a scleral lens practice? So do you think there are some opportunities there? Probably there is nothing much we are, uh, we are almost there and there's nothing much we can do. <laughs> no. Or you are not sure. Awesome. Great. So I think Great majority time. of them are saying yes, there are yeah. a couple of opportunities and I think you're going to discuss some of them with us today. Uh, yeah. About 80% of them, sorry, are saying yes. A mm -hmm. couple That's of them are unsure and yeah. No, very good. And um, um, uh, yeah, what, what, we, what we get from practitioners that we work with that uh, they would absolutely agree there is a, there's a huge potential there and uh, scleral lenses can be really sight saving um, can uh, play an active role in postponing um, uh, certain surgery procedures and and therefore uh, I mean what you don't need to to do surgery wise can often be quite beneficial for the eye uh, particularly if the patient is relatively young um, so there are many, many advantages to, uh, to scleral lenses. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's dig a bit into uh, to fitting scleral lenses. But, but let me start out by saying is that we don't have time today to really dig into uh, scleral lens fitting and in, in all its intricacy. Um, I, I do refer you, we have a number of videos, and I'm, I'm quite sure that the OLS has, uh, has videos on that as well. Um, but there are, um, last year we held a, a, three, a series of three um, uh, webinars, which in, in, in increasing um, uh, uh, what do you call it? complexity um, uh, explained the full process of scleral lens fitting. So I'd be happy to refer you to that. Contact me after uh, if you're interested. So... Um, but the essence of, of a scleral lens is that it's fitted on um, a, a pathologic cornea that uh, most of times is so sensitive that it doesn't bear any touch of a lens. So uh, um, an essential criterion or a characteristic of a scleral lens that it vaults over the complete cornea and, uh, and only lands beyond the limbus on the sclera. And so um, proper central clearance, uh, uh, step number one, is, 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 is a critical first uh, parameter that you need to get right. Um, diameter is, is the second one, because um, the limbal zone is where um, stem cells are created. So again, you do not want to have any rub there, any touch there. You want the lens to vault over the limbus and then land on the sclera. And that haptic that rests on the sclera, you want to follow the shape of the sclera uh, in, in uh, all around 360 degrees. Um, so again, so you get the best uh, fits imaginable. And there's basically three zones that you can identify there, the optical zone, and that will differ a little bit from, from lens design to lens design, but usually it's about nine millimeters. And, um, and most um, corneas are about uh, 12 millimeters um, uh, in diameter. And so um, the first point of touch of a scleral lens usually is around 13, perhaps a little bit more, 13 plus millimeters. And, um, and then the, the actual diameter of the lens depends really on the manufacturer. It depends also on, on how pathologic the eye is. Um, you need different designs for different eyes. That is, that is very clear. Um, and usually the, the mid the mid landing zone is around 15 millimeters. And fitting traditionally has been done with a fitting set. Now you see an example here on, on the right. Um, so these consist of a, a number of, um, of sizes of, of, of central volts. Uh, quite often you can have uh, more than one diameter in there as well. And um, 
And this is the way that people have been fitting spheral lenses. And, and of course, they, they, they've, they've been quite successful in that way, but there are some, some, some significant uh, problems with that is that the, the number of uh, fits you need to do even before you start ordering the lens is, is going to be uh, quite substantive. Uh, usually about three, four lenses that you need to place on the eye, particularly, of course, if the eye is more irregular. And, um, and even then, when you put in the first order, um, you can, yeah, uh, experience shows that still it will require uh, a couple of reorders before you uh, hit the, 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 the optimal fitting lens. And, uh, and of course, each time you use one of these, these, these trial set lenses, you need to disinfect them. Uh, right now, uh, we're still in, in, the, in, in, in COVID times, and, and um, we hear from the practitioners that they, they really look for ways that they can reduce this amount of trial fitting and, uh, and reduce the number of lenses that, that have to be fitted until they have the, the optimal fitting uh, scleral lens. And so if you contrast this then with... Um, profilometry driven scleral lens fitting, it, um, because you measure the full surface of the, uh, of the eye, um, it allows you, um, uh, you can do that, uh, you, do, you can do the assessment manually with some calculations, or you can make use of the fitting algorithms. Um, and it allows you to come uh, much closer to the ideal, ideal fit. Uh, with the very first lens that you put on the eye. And um, with profilometry, of course, you always still need to calculate the over-refraction. And for that, you still need to put a lens on the eye, you know, particularly for an irregular eye that, that is required. But it could, for example, be a GP lens. Uh, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a scleral lens. And, uh, and all in all, it allows for a much more efficient process that particularly for the more irregular eyes um, can reduce the, the number of refits uh, significantly. So with um, the eye surface profiler, uh, one thing is, is that it's fully focused on special contact lens fitting. So we've been talking about scrill so far. Um, but it also includes uh, ortho K designed hybrid soft and RGP. Um, and so on all of these fronts, we're working very closely with practitioners to uh, open up more possibilities for um, getting better fits in a shorter amount of time. And um, we are now connected to uh, at least 20 labs, at least 20 lens manufacturers, and uh, we are constantly working on improving that and increasing that. Because our, our goal is, is to enable the practitioner uh, to be much more efficient with specialty contact lenses. And, and, and we want to do that for any lens that they are comfortable uh, working with. Um, fitting scleral lenses, we have uh, developed a, um, a, um, a nomogram to guide people through um, the various options uh, leading to uh, spheric, toric, quad-specific, or irregular um, um, uh, shaped um, um, scroll lens designs. And all of that is based on exact data that has been measured of the, of the surface of the eye. Um, however, there's also the route that you, um, that you can go to the... Um, uh, and make use of the, the lens fitting algorithms that have been developed. And basically what they do in collaboration with the lens manufacturer, um, it matches the, the front surface of the eye with the, uh, with the, um, with the back surface of the lens. And, um, and out of that comes uh, a best fitting lens uh, within, uh, within a couple of seconds. So the procedure is fairly easy. You make a good measurement, of course. That is, that is step number one. Um, you select the supplier of choice. 
and, uh, and then the lens of choice and the diameter, and you click on calculate, and out then comes uh, the full order uh, parameters that you would need to, uh, to, to place an order for this particular eye. And, uh, and that then you can, uh, you can push directly to the lens manufacturer who will not only get your order, but also will get the, the map or the measurement made um, so that should you need to make an adjustment, they know exactly what the shape of the eye is, which should uh, really improve the conversation that you have with your lens manufacturer. And uh, we're going to make a very short sidestep into profilometry driven ortho K fitting. And for that, we have another poll. It's just to know how many ortho K fits uh, do you fit? Are you probably fitting less than five, six to 10, more than 10, or you are not fitting any ortho K at this point of time? All right. So it looks like most of them are uh, who are regular fitters, I would say. They fit less than five a yeah. month uh, on an average. And uh, a couple of them also fit about six to 10 as well, a bit more experience. Uh, yeah. practice maybe yeah yeah ortho k of course is, is very much uh in the center of uh, attention or getting a lot of attention uh due to uh, myopia management and the role the very beneficial role that it plays in 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 in, in retaining and managing the the progression of uh of uh, myopia in 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 our teenagers and and, and children and um, so we, oh, let me just do this. Okay. so quick uh, sidestep, because we've been talking about uh, scleral lens um, uh, fitting before. And, um, but of course, what you've seen throughout all of the maps uh, in, in, in the previous slides is that profilometry captures the full cornea from limbus to limbus every time. Uh, there's no exception. And, and of course, it does so at a very high accuracy, uh, two micron to be precise. And, uh, and so there is nothing to stop profilometry from being a very efficient um, solution for ortho K fitting as well. And, um, and, and also there, it, it will lead to reduction of the number of refits and, uh, and ultimately to better patient outcomes. Um, and so, yeah, so the whole goal with this is, is, uh, is precision with the initial lens fit. And um, profilometry is uh, the measurement itself uh, because, there is, because there's a large distance between the, the measurement device and, and the eye. Um, it, is, uh, it is quite easy to, uh, to measure children um, with this technology. Okay, so, but um, I'd say um, the proof is in the, in the eating of the pudding. And um, so uh, I'm very happy to introduce four case examples by practitioners uh, in, in various countries. There is Dr. Melissa Burnett, who, who starts off, and then uh, there's Dr. Jesus Vidauri, and uh, Dr. Sheila Morrison, and uh, Dr. Aaron Wolf. And um, these have been recorded in a video. And, um, and I will play that video for you now. And each one of them, there's going to be two scleral um, cases by the two first uh, practitioners and then two ortho K cases by the two last ones. Let's have a look. This is just uh, one example of a patient. So 48 year old Hispanic female. So I practice it at UC Davis in Northern California. And we have a lot of patients who come from all over the world. We're a specialty practice. We get a lot of referrals, but we see a lot of patients from Mexico as well because we're in California. So she actually had RK done in Mexico and she was saying that her vision was blurry 
at all distances. She is relatively young. I'm continuously surprised how these patients are so young who have had RK. And of course, highly irregular astigmatism, no big surprise. We also, very important to evaluate the ocular surface prior to fitting lenses. So she did have, and she much better controlled now, but my bone gland dysfunction and dry eye, so doing a complete workup there. She wore corneal lenses, corneal gas permeable lenses, and here you can see her prescription. So she, at this time, was unable from a different provider to be fit with corneal lenses, and she, she came to me and we talked about different technologies. So here you can see her bisphere elevation maps, and kind of short and sweet case here, but she was fit with lenses, in a reverse geometry design, she was able to wear, she is able to wear the lenses all day long, very, very successfully, and reports even better vision and improved comfort with this lens design. So she had pretty significant dry eyes. Now she's able to wear the lenses all day. The one thing that she is developing of interest, which I feel like everyone is developing right now, is cataracts. Everyone is coming in with cataracts. And so we're talking about that and her scleral lenses and how we're gonna change that after cataract surgery. Fortunately, we don't have to change the scleral lens a lot, but the power we do have to change. So just one case of many, many, but very happy uh, with her scleral lens design. 31-year-old patient, uh, she's a Hispanic female. Uh, she has a, she's from a different part of Mexico. And she got LASIK surgery done in 2012 when she was 21 years old. Unfortunately, developed uh, post-LASIK ectasia in her right eye and developed also dry eye uh, in both eyes, more so in the right. Uh, in the same city, they placed an intrastromal corneal ring in the inferior part of the cornea, which unfortunately uh, she faced then a couple months later extrusion of the ring. So it had to be surgically removed. Uh, they did cross-linking on that eye and then also on the left eye, which they were following up closely with topographies and started seeing some changes, so they went ahead and, and cross-linked. At that point, she moved uh, to our city in Monterrey, Mexico, and was referred to us. And she was, uh, had a visual acuity of uh, 20 over 200 in her right eye, the one that had the rings put in and, and taken out, and 2040 in the left eye, and some uh, discomfort due to dry eye. We got her in the office, we talked to her about sclerals. Uh, everywhere is still an expensive uh, technology, and in Mexico more so. So uh, we went ahead and fitted her, her more problematic eye, which in this case was the right eye. We had to do three remakes to get uh, a good lens, and were able to get her happy. This was back in 2016, uh, and she was 2020, and got at least eight hours of comf comfortable wearing time. Sometimes, you know, took, it, took the lens out in between in lunch time so she could extend for some more hours. So this is an example of a patient that was already happy, but now that we got uh, to, to make lenses for her using this new ESP technology, as you will see, she was uh, way, way more happy. Uh, so this is actually a couple months ago that we got the, the ESP in, in our office. Uh, so we scanned both of her eyes, uh, just because we were also kind of practicing. Um, and she was only going to do it for her right eye. Uh, you can see that in the right eye, uh, this is uh, the bisphere elevation map that the ESP gives you. Uh, you see a fairly uh, spherical uh, scleral shape. Um, and that's why we have been able to get her happy with spherical haptics uh, five, six years ago. Uh, but on the left side, and I was a little bit surprised, uh, then you have a more complicated scleral shape, more complicated conjunctival situation as well with some uh, big elevations, at, at especially at 3 p.m. and also at 4 p.m. So when I saw that, because she, when I started uh, showing her the ESP and the images, she said, oh, I want to get it now in both eyes. So a little bit uh, what uh, Dr. Morrison was telling us, when they see the images and you get the 3D scan in the, in the <coughs> TV and everything, uh, they get really excited as well. Um, so I said, okay, let's do both eyes. We'll talk first about the right eye. This is uh, basically what we did is we took the shot with the ESP. We sent it, in, this is a um, um, uh, lens made with Aculens. Uh, we sent it to the Aculens lab. Uh, we sent them the previous lens parameters with the previous uh, lens over refraction. We didn't even put a new lens on top of the eye and, and told them, you know, let's see what, what you can do with this. We were kind of testing out the technology, and they sent us this lens. 
uh, which as you can see uh, fits really nicely. The eye look, looks white. You have nice coverage on the OCT images. Uh, you get this fluorescent pattern that the ESP also gives you where basically you see in this case that there's coverage all around. Uh, so she was instantly really happy with that and we'll discuss the, some of the results a little bit later. On the left eye, which was the first time we put uh, scleral on, on that eye, uh, and it was a mo more complicated eye in terms of the scleral topography. As you see in this uh, image on the bottom left, uh, the, the lens haptic has uh, an elevation. This is a, f a free form uh, lens, and that's actually about 300 microns elevation. It was uh, a big uh, conjunctival elevation we had to get over. And this was, we didn't have to measure a anything. It was basically done off the scan. Uh, and again, you see a white uh, eye in happy patient, you know, happy eye. And uh, so basically this is on the top, this was her previous situation. She was a happy patient with 2020, uh, who got about eight hours of comfortable wearing time in her right eye. And that took us three remakes to, to achieve back in 2016. Now uh, in the, in 2020, 2021 it was, uh, we did both lenses that, that we described. Both were done in the first order. Uh, she's getting 13 hours of wearing time. Uh, and she's very happy because now she resolved the, the dry eye issue in her left eye as well. Plus, she was also, uh, one of the things she wanted to is to not have a asymmetrical lid opening. So she was also very happy with that. So that was her first patient. Uh, obviously, they don't all go that way, but we were, were really excited for her. And, and she, she's now in love with both of her sclerals. Well, uh, and, you. <laughs> and you. And you, yeah. yeah. This is actually um, used with permission. This is my actual patient. Um, she's one of our staff, and she's, she is excited to be famous in Vegas today. And uh, she presented um, as a new patient myopic, a little bit of astigmatism. Her biggest issue is contact lens dropout. So we talk about ESP use for scleral lens patients, ortho -K myopia control, um, we also have applications, other applications outside of myopia control for ortho-K, so in this case it's a dry eye case. Um, you can see her refraction there, so not a particularly out of the ordinary ortho-K fit, although on the left eye for some it may be getting, you know, you're getting astigmatism and kind of moderate myopia. Um, so we took measurements, I threw this in here just to show you for the case for completion to include her lid scan, so she str struggled, you know, she suffers and she can't wear her soft contacts during the day. Um, with the eaglet, we're now able to utilize it for ortho-K. And so what you're looking at here is our map of Brook um, showing her elevation map. And that's the data that we like to use when designing ortho-K lenses. Um, here is an example of our corneal elevation map of the same patient. And her baseline map. This is how we use the software to empirically predict and design uh, a CRT ortho-K lens. So um, in this field, um, we can select, in this case, Cooper Vision, Paragon CRT, and the software will predict our starting lens, similar to like a slide rule, but it's completely done independently through um, the Eaglet folks and uh, all the algorithms that they've um, expanded on over the past 12 plus months and um, to create the data that we need for our OrthoK lens. Now this does connect with Direct Connect um, that Dr. Wolf had talked about and to make the order process really smooth, everything's digital, so it speeds things up a lot in the practice. There's a record of everything that you're doing. Things go straight to the manufacturer for the order, if you choose to. And this is the lens on the first lens. So as we can see, this is an absolute beautiful lens. I did not fabricate this. This was Brooke's first lens based on her ESP. And the lens looks so great that I decided to take some artsy photos of it. Um, and away she went. So we can look at difference display maps um, now with the ESP as well. Um, so for ortho-K fitters, we know we need to look at our power change, but also tangential curvature as a primary measure of the centration of that lens when the patient sleeps. All very doable and very effective at this point with the software. And then here's a little closer up here. And then here's our axial and tangential curvature maps as well, all generated from the ESP. This is basically a, a typical ortho-K candidate, uh, kind of a, a you know, moderate uh, myope, especially you know, for nine years old, so concerning. So we implemented some uh, myopia management with ortho-K. Uh, she is a, a minus, about a minus 250 on the right eye. Uh, at about a month follow-up, these are her comparison maps or her difference maps. You can see uh, the vision's not quite as good on the right eye. 
Um, if you look in your uh, power profile map right there, this is going to show you how much power change you've had. So two adopters of power change, that's going to leave us about half adopter of the refraction. It's a 250. You basically are just showing off the precision of the instrument. Very uh, well predicted two adopters of change there. Okay. On the left eye, this was about a two adopter, about a 175 to two adopter uh, myope. And same thing, if you look at the precision of the uh, power profile, predicted it very nicely. Okay, those are the, the four cases. And, uh, and that also concludes the, the presentation I have prepared for you today. Uh, on screen, you'll see uh, various ways that you can contact us and uh, don't hesitate in doing so. And, uh, and we're very, uh, I'm very open to, uh, to uh, any questions you have right now. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful presentation. And I think I would like to thank all the four doctors uh, who were present with us virtually as well, sharing the experience. Right. Uh, yeah. Was this the one shared during the GSLS recently? Am I right? Or last year, I guess. Uh, this so this was uh, yeah just a few weeks ago in uh, in Las Vegas at the GSLS uh, 2022. Awesome, great. So the reason I asked is because this is fresh from the oven, this right? It's very fresh. Yes, <laughs> very fresh. And, and, and it's 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 in that sense it's not being um, shown publicly like it like it's it's been here in this webinar. So in that sense it is uh, it's first time view. Awesome, great. So uh, those who are interested in the product, I think you can directly contact sir and you can take a screenshot of uh, you know the screen now because you have a lot of information there where you can directly get in touch uh, with Eaglet Eye and they, I think they'll be very happy to answer your queries and questions regarding the product as well as you know the availability in your particular regions and your countries as well. At this point in time, scleral profilometry is talking about the anterior corneal surface only. We are not talking anything about posterior corneal surface no. as of now, right? Yeah. No. Yes. No, and, and it's because uh, fluorescein is so important. And of course, there's you can only put fluorescein on, on, on the top surface of the, uh, mix it in with the tear film and, and, and not beyond. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's more of the anterior corneal uh, conjunctival scleral surface and not at posterior. I think in the nearby future, that would be great to have that tagged along, right? <laughs> yes, it would be. But yeah, but yeah, it's so, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, agreed. Awesome. Great. Uh, let's take one question here, which popped up. Uh, by the experience of profilometry, do you think scleral structure uh, gets affected by dry eye severity? Has there any reports come out that patients with dry eyes have different morphology or structure of the sclera? Anything on that? I'm, I'm not aware of any publication, any research results in that direction. No. Not really. Okay, great. And uh, the other question which just came up, I'm just going to pull that up and see. Uh, you did mention to use the fluorescein uh, while performing, you know, the profilometry, especially during when we are using ESP. Yeah. So, is it is it uh, how how long of a time do you think the fluorescein must be there? Because you said that the scan is very quick; it will yeah. take less than one second. Yeah. So, do you have do you want the patient to you know instill the fluorescein? set into the uh, eye for a couple of seconds only then click or we should just do it as soon as possible you know something like that yeah with you know uh, most of our users are 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 fitting scleral lenses on pathologic eyes and quite often their tear films are disturbed you know they they have dry eye and sometimes severe dry eye so uh, it's always going to be a challenge that you want to have uh, the best imaginable coverage of, of, of tear foam and, of course, with fluorescein uh, included of, of the eye. So time is always, uh, is always pressing. Um, however, there are really some, some fairly easy to way uh, to, to, to do things that can improve that a lot. And um, what we strongly recommend all of the, the practitioners, and I, I'd say that uh, this is for any device measuring the eye. Never just rely on one measurement. Always make 
at two or three and, and, and have a quick look if they are about similar. If they are, you know that you know the, the results are, are, are trustworthy uh, and, and you can just pick the best one out of the three. So with one dose of fluorescein into, uh, into the eye, you should be capable of getting three measurements without too much uh, time stress. Great. But at the same time, we encourage people to, hey, you, you can't, uh, you know, you, once you put the fluorescein, you need to take the measurement. That is very clear. That is very clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's important because, you know, uh, as you rightly pointed out, we always want to take a couple of measurements to test for the repeatability, you know. So it's, it's, it's quite good that the instrument actually captures it quite quickly. So you don't have to, you know, reinstill the fluorescein and look at it again. So that's really uh, good for us as clinicians when we are into practice. Yeah, be happy to contact us. Uh, we do a fantastic online demo and we can take it from there. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And, and one more question, sir. When it comes to, you did mention that uh, using ESP reduces the number of fits for getting into the final fits. Of course, we understand we are mapping everything. Any particular case whereby profilometry didn't work? You said that, okay, profilometry couldn't work and you had to do a lot. So any, any particular case you came across, probably if you would want to share about that. Well, any, any technology, any instrument uh, always has a limit. And there's always somewhere where it says, okay, but this and, and, and not further. And uh, this is very clear. And um, there is... Um, uh, there's a Dr. Uh, Ken Pullum in the UK, and there is Dr. Chris Sind in, in, in the US. And they have, for the, the very most difficult 1%, 2% of cases, they have the system where you, where you put in the, the, blue, uh, the blue goo onto the eye, you make an impression of the eye, and you scan that, and then you, you base it off that. So... Absolutely. I mean, if, if you, but you're really talking about the, the worst, most complex one, two percent of cases, there is a limit to everything. And, um, and, and, and so, yeah, it's, it's the same with profilometry. Yes. Yeah. yes. But I, 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 what we found is that it's very robust for irregular pathologic eyes. Uh, there's ways around the, um, the problems with, uh, with tear film stability. And so uh, we're, we're pretty confident that 98% uh, of, of eyes can be covered. Yeah. Awesome. Great. And I think you brought up a very good point that, you know, if one technology doesn't work, the second one is ready. So you, if, of course. If, if your profilometry uh, is not suitable for whatever reasons for the patient, yeah. Yeah. you have a second technology, which is the impression method of uh, fitting scleral lenses. So now yeah, the... Yeah. Very similar with uh, with scleral lens designs, you know. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it is it is important as a practitioner that you you don't you're not dependent on a single design because you will come across an eye where where that design, as good as it might be, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't work for that particular eye. So it is it's important to have alternatives. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Wonderful. Awesome. Great. So I think with that, we have taken up uh, the questions which have popped up, which were very related to the talk. So with that, I would like to thank uh, you so much for, you know, sharing that with us and also to the virtual, uh, I would say, our guest speakers, which joined us and shared their experience. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity. We do have a section planned next weekend. Until then, Take care, be safe, and I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye.